All right, so let's talk about the reversal for a little bit. So this came out in February of 2007. Uh, it was a long experiment in the making, I, I think a three-year experiment, um, very complicated technologies that were used. The key, and I'm going to take a moment and actually explain the experiment, because I think there's a lot of questions among families about, well, if they did it in mice, why can't we just do the exact same thing and do it in people? And I think it's important to understand why it's a proof of principle experiment and what does it teach us, but also what do we not take from that experiment? So what it teaches is, a, which, which um, Dr. Duchik mentioned uh, in her welcoming remarks, these mice were adult mice, and I think that's the, the very encouraging news for us as parents. These were not newborns, these were not done at birth, these were mice that were allowed to become adults. Uh, they had all of the symptoms that a typical Rett syndrome mouse has, including teeth grinding, by the way. Um, they can look at uneven wearing of the teeth, and they know that we can't hear it, but we know that those mice grind their teeth. Um, and and when the treatment, and I'll explain what that meant, was done, within four weeks, the, the symptoms that could be assayed, that could be detected, they, they looked at different things like gait, inertia, meaning hypoactivity, how much did the mice move, breathing, the hind limb clasping, when you pick them up from the tail, they grab their, their hind limbs together, tremor, and also general condition of the mouse, how healthy or not did it look, and lethality. I mean, these mice, the male mice are typically dead somewhere between 8 and 14 weeks, and these mice lived much longer. Um, by the way, the experiment was done in both males and females mice, and both were recovered. And also long-term potentiation. So they actually <coughs> did electrophysiology experiments to look at how these nerve cells in the brain, neurons, communicated with each other, and the long-term potentiation problem, which is seen in the Rett syndrome mice, was completely recovered as well. Now, since that experiment came out, Professor Bird has looked at other um, symptoms in the mice, and, and so far I have to say that everything I've heard is encouraging. <laughs> so everything they've looked at has gotten better. Now, they have not yet done very detailed behavioral things. They haven't looked at anxiety, they, learning. I mean, obviously language you can't do in a mouse, but... Um, but those experiments are now underway, and I think it will be interesting to see what about the social issues, what about the anxiety, what about some of the, the learning paradigms that they can test in a mouse. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the experiment, okay? So in order to do this experiment, so Adrian Bird had already, already developed a knockout mouse, which was published in, I think, 2001. And Huda Zogby had a knockout mouse, Rudolf Janisch had a knockout mouse. But in order to do this experiment, he had to develop a new knockout mouse. And the reason for that is he wanted to create an animal that would have no MECP2, and so would develop all the symptoms, but then at will turn that MECP2 back on and be able to see what would happen to the symptoms. So how do you create that on-off switch? And so the way they did it is through technology that's used. They didn't develop the technology, but... Um, they, they implemented it for this partic particular experiment. So what they did is at the singular embryonic stem cell stage of a mouse, at the MECP2 gene, they inserted these foreign pieces of DNA called LOXP sites on either side of the MECP2 gene. And basically it's like putting in a roadblock. And so it, 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 al it allows, it doesn't allow the MECP2 gene to make protein. All right, these roadblocks keep the MECP2 gene down knocked out so that it doesn't function. So they, they took that embryonic stem cell, they made a mouse from it. Um, so the mouse in every one of its cells had the MECP2 gene, but because of these roadblocks, it wasn't making protein. And then the mouse grew up and, and had developed all of the symptoms. Then they took another mouse, which they did not develop, but which they developed these mice with something called Cree. And this is a protein that's not typically found in a mouse, but it, these are mice that are engineered so that they have this protein, Cre, And that Cre is sitting in the cytoplasm of the cell, not in the nucleus, but in all the stuff that's around the nucleus. They bred these two mice together. They bred the Cre mice with the MECP2 knockout mice. The offspring mice now have MECP2 with the roadblock, so they're not making any protein, but they also have Cre in the cytoplasm of every cell. Now, when the, when the investigator wants to flip the switch and turn the MECP2 gene back on, they inject the mouse with a drug called tamoxifen. And some of you may know that tamoxifen is a breast cancer drug. 
But the reason they use tamoxifen is because what it, what it, it, it interacts with the Cree protein that's in the cytoplasm and it releases it. So the Cree protein goes out of the cytoplasm, enters the nucleus, and splices out the Lux P sites that are keeping the MECP2 gene silent. Pretty sophisticated. All right. As the roadblocks are spliced out, the gene starts to make its protein. And as the protein starts to become available, the symptoms start to go away. And during a four-week span, the mice, at least looking at them with the, just your eye, observing them, were indistinguishable from he their healthy wild, wild type, meaning normal mice. Um, so that's the experiment. And that's why we can't do the same thing in our children. If we gave them tamoxifen, it would hurt them, <laughs> probably. It wouldn't help them. They don't have this Cree protein, and they don't have these roadblocks in their... It, you know, it, it, on either side of their MECP2 gene. So giving them tamoxifen is not going to do anything. And so we have to figure out a way to normalize their MECP2 protein in other ways. So this doesn't point to a treatment, but what it does suggest very strongly is that if we had treatments and if we could normalize MECP2, the symptoms would go away.